uh, I want to. I asked Barbie if she would uh, tag team with me again, and um, so I have in my mind what I want to share. A few weeks ago, I shared, I wrote a picture of, a, drew a picture of a tree with roots, and let me tell you where this started real quick. I, I began to realize a couple of months ago again, re-realize the importance of our words. And how, I mean, the scripture says in James chapter 3 that your tongue and the words that come out of your mouth, he compares to a bridle on a horse. And you think about that, it's a small little piece of metal and it goes in the mouth with some reins. But that little bit and bridle can, can steer the horse left or right, can make it stop, it can guide that horse. And then he compares the tongue to a rudder, which is a small thing on a big ship, but it can steer the ship. It can steer the ship. And he, then he goes on to compare your tongue to a spark, such a small thing, just a little match, but it can destroy a forest. And so your tongue can guide, it can turn, it can direct, and it can destroy your life. So I began thinking that. And then, um, so I knew that I wanted to share on, on just our words and how important they are, and then just to remind us to be careful about the words that come out of our mouths. But then I realized that Jesus said that um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so, uh, y'all may not know this, uh, but on your hot water tank, there is something called a release valve. If the pressure builds up, it opens and the water comes out. And so, our mouths are really just a release valve for what's in our hearts. So, I realized I can't, we can't talk about the tongue and our words, really, unless we talk about our hearts. But we all don't care about our tongue and our hearts so much. We want to know about our circumstances. I want my circumstances to be good. But our, our circumstances a lot of times are governed or determined by the words that come out of our mouths, which are really just a reflection of what's in our hearts. So it's a, kind of a whole lot to talk about. In that lecture, a few lecture, if I can call it a lecture, sermon teaching a few weeks ago, um, I realized there's five, I called them evil roots because they are the roots of the tree that produce words that create circumstances. Five evil roots. And they are really self-pity, which produces words of complaining. Ah, this, no, nah, that, you know, complaining. Another one is uh, just a judgmental spirit, which produces words of um, criticism. Now, I'm not saying that if you criticize, you've got a judgmental spirit. No, but if you just kind of eaten up with criticism, maybe you have a judgmental spirit. It's something to, to check ourselves, to look at ourselves and see. And then there's blame. You know anybody? I know it's none of you, but you have friends or cousins that blame. They lost every job they ever had because of the boss or a co-worker. Every marriage is the other person that failed. It's the other person. Every argument is the other person. It's just blame, 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 blame. Victim thinking is just a, it's a root. It's a stronghold that sometimes produces these words that aren't good. And then I, 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 pessimism is a fourth one. And it really, the, the spiritual term would be unbelief. It's rooted in unbelief. It's just pessimism. It's like things aren't good and things aren't going to get better. And that, that's a spirit that, that, that produces these words of just of unbelief and, and discouragement. And we've got to be careful. And then the fifth is control. And this is a new one for me. The Lord kind of uh, um, has revealed this to me recently that, uh, Stan, are you disappointed in that person? Yeah, I'm really disappointed in that person. And that person? Yeah, that person too. And it's because you want to control them. But Lord, I, I, I want good for them. Yeah, you want good for them, but you can't live their life for them. You can't, you can't. It's the spirit of control. So I want to talk about all these things, right? So I asked Barbie if she wants to kind of do a tag team thing again, and she does. And so I send her a text on Friday night and said, hey, this is what I'm thinking. And I put my phone down. I go to bed. I wake up Saturday morning, and she sends me a text back. And so it's a picture of two pages of a book, and, you know, and then her text. And the pages of the book, you know, have y'all ever gotten a picture of a page of a book? It's like you got to do this to your phone and turn it sideways. And, and so I thought, well, I'll get to that in a minute. I just read her text. And her text basically said, and y'all know it's from Barbie. So if you know Barbie, you know what it had to do with. It had to do with the love of God and how she thinks that we need to, to bring, to tie in to all, this, all these things, all these evil roots I want to teach on, the love of Jesus. And so, and how the love of Jesus is so paramount in us overcoming. And so, I put the phone down and headed for the coffee pot. And, and I kind of, with this tone to the Lord, Lord, uh, I don't know how I'm going to tie that in. I feel sorry for Barbie because I got the message. It's, you know, it's hard for someone else to say, listen, I'm passionate about this. Here, you teach on it too. It's hard to do. I've done that before. And so, as I'm going to the coffee pot, I'm like, Lord, 
how am I going to tie all this in, you know? I mean, I know your love and everything, but, you know, I've got these five evil roots. I want to talk about it and how to overcome them. And, and then I said this to the Lord. Barbie is so one-dimensional. And does that sound like I'm complaining? <laughs> does it sound like I'm being critical? Lord, I want to teach on complaining and criticism, but I'm criticizing Barbie and complaining to you and <laughs> about this. So I pour my cup of coffee and a little cream, no sugar, and I go back, and I sit down with where I've got my Bible and my notes, and I pull up the text again, because now it's time for me to do this and read what she's been reading that she thinks we need to tie in here. And so I read this, and within two minutes, or no more than three, of me telling the Lord that Barbie is so one-dimensional, and y'all know I mean by one-dimensional, we're not, when I was talking to the Lord, I was thinking about the wishbone offense and Barry Switzer and OU, you know, just one-dimensional. Never mind, he won five national championships. It's just one-dimensional. Just run, 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 run. But Okay, never mind. The Lord understood what I was referring to. <laughs> one-dimensional isn't a word I use all the time. I've never described anybody as being one-dimensional, but this time, out loud, I said it to the Lord, and I sit down and I read, and the first line is, the love of Jesus is multidimensional. <laughs> I swear, I promise you, that was within two minutes of me talking to the Lord and complaining about Barbie being one-dimensional. So that could be coincidence, but I don't think so. And if it wasn't coincidence, if the Lord was talking to Stan, what was he saying? What's the message? The message could be one of two things. It could be, Stan... Quit your criticizing and complaining. Or, if being one-dimensional is a problem for you, Stan, you need to know that the one dimension is multidimensional. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Real quick, we've got to hurry, got to hurry, hurry. Matthew 12, and then we're going to go to Ephesians 3, and I'm going to try to do all this in about seven more minutes or six Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, Matthew 12, 43, Matthew 12, 43. Jesus is speaking and he says this. Y'all have heard this before, but I want to talk about this. When an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through the waterless places seeking rest, but it finds none. Verse 44, then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty. Everybody say empty. 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 Say it again. Say it three times. Empty, empty, empty. Okay. Empty is not good. Everybody know that. <laughs> I want to talk today about these five evil roots, and I want to tell you, get them out. Get them out. Get them out of your heart. Get them out of your mind. Get them out. But then you might be empty. <laughs> But it, when it comes back, it finds the house empty, swept, and clean, and put in order. Then it goes and it brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first, and so it will be with this evil generation. Now, I understand we read that and we think, oh, he's talking about demonic possession. And then when he casts the demon out, that's what he's talking about. How often does that happen? How often does it happen? How often have any of us experienced demon possession? Someone that's completely set free because a demon convulsed them violently and they're foaming at the mouth and they left, huh? A few of us may have, but not very many of us many of the times. So I don't know that Jesus would put something in the Bible that takes up this much room for something that rarely happens or most of us never experience. So I want to say that if you get hung up on that, I want you to realize that well, I think that when you say an unclean spirit is gone, you can say when an attitude, a bad attitude has left a person, when a person overcomes a bad attitude, when a person overcomes a sinful habit, when a over, person overcomes and they get rid of something that, that, that they shouldn't be in their life, anything like that, you better be careful. You better not leave the house empty because it'll come back. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, I have the advantage of using sticky notes and I have my, oh, where, where they need to be, but Ephesians 3, what's the key word of the last scripture we just read? I made you say it. 
empty. Verse 14, Ephesians 3, 14, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Verse 16, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you, this is Paul's prayer, I'm praying that God would grant you, that God would grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, in your roots, <laughs> not your foliage, but in your roots, the roots of your life, the roots, everybody say roots, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being what? Rooted. And grounded in what? That one-dimensional, multi-dimensional thing. That you would be rooted and grounded in love. That you may have strength. Everybody say strength. strength. To comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That you may be what? Filled. Filled. Everybody say filled. filled. Say it three times. Filled, filled, filled. Yeah, you're not to be empty, you're to be filled. Filled with what? Filled with what? Filled with this. I want to say the love of God, but the love of God is such a generic word that we just, oh, the love of God. And we even sang two different songs that we sang today. Talk about the unfailing love of God, the unfailing love. And we, we speak about that unfailing love like, oh, yeah, in history, it, God's unfailing love. But listen, if you don't know it, if you don't know it, if you don't know it, if you haven't experienced His unfailing love, you know, when I went from Catholicism to baptistry, which is kind of my progression to where I am now, is ge ge generic brand of Christianity, uh, one, thing that kind of, um, one thing that kind of got my attention was, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Personal? personal? <laughs> yeah, he's my personal Lord and Savior. You ever heard that? My personal? 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 Yeah, he's my personal Lord. Is he your personal Lord? The word personal was just big to me. Like, I never heard that word in Catholicism. Personal. Well, I want to tell you about his unfailing love. Is it personal? Or you use it to say, oh, I know God has unfailing love. Is it personal? But here he's saying that you may be filled. And listen, if you are, if you know that love that surpasses knowledge, you will be filled. Look at the promise. You'll be filled to the fullness of the measure of God. Last thing on emptying and filling. Lest you think, and Barbie may have a different take on this. I don't think she does. Because she's one dimensional. <laughs> but listen, it's a good dimension. I hope y'all know I'm teasing her. The Lord, I, th that was the Lord's way of spanking me, by the way. I hope you know that. He does that very lovely, lovingly and gently. It's not like you got something, I've got a sin, I've got something, I've got a wrong concept. And, and the title of this is Five Destructive Mindsets. Because that's what I'm talking about. And I'm going to finish up next week. But what good is it to know the destructive mindsets if you don't understand the solution? But the, what I want, the last point I want to make before Barbie comes, it's not you emptying stuff out, and now you've got an empty place, but you don't want that to come back. And so therefore, once it's empty, you get the love, a revelation. I want to call it a revelation and celebration of the love of Christ for you. It's a revelation and a celebration of His love. You get that to replace that which is empty. No, I don't think it works that way. That is kind of a legalistic way to be free from legalism. It's the love of Jesus comes in, and when it comes in, it pushes it all out. That's the way it is. Father, I pray for Barbie. If you give her a clear word and you give her peace, I pray for us, for the ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Take her away, Barbie. Thanks. So just um, in the Passion Translation, just to finish, Ephesians 4, verse 17, as uh, Stan was talking about the five evil roots or the five mindsets, verse 17 here in this translation says, Then, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you, and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. So, Stan, I've known him 28 years. Uh, Stan and Patty and loved him. We've walked through a lot together, laughed a lot together, cried together. Um, but when a friend of 28 years calls you one-dimensional, <laughs> kind of like, hmm. And Stan and I were talking yesterday, and he goes, now, you say you don't get offended easily, right? And I said, right. And he goes, okay, so I'm going to tell you what the Lord did. And so he says that, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not offended. 
But what it did is it caused introspection in me because I'm like, oh my gosh, my friend of 28 years just think I have one dimension. So I guess he's right. <laughs> and then I'm thinking about my life, like over my whole life. You know how your mind goes. So I'm like, yeah, when I go out to eat at certain restaurants, I get the same thing every time. I'm just one dimensional. <laughs> and then the place where I buy my clothes, I pretty much shop at the same store all the time. Hi, I'm one dimensional. Every morning I have the same exact thing for breakfast, protein shake with blueberries and strawberries. No, spinach and blueberries. I'm kind of one dimensional. I have my like crazy schedule in the morning. I get up, I have my Jesus time, I go work out, have my shake, get to the office, get to the office and I start my little diffuser, make it smell good plug in my laptop. I mean, like, I pretty much think I might be one-dimensional. And then I'm thinking of, in the love of God, what is my bent? What do I always talk about? Okay, love. So I was thinking back to a friend of mine at the office that we've had discussions, and, and we have an office of 55 agents, and we often, some of us pray for the others, and one of them was just having some kind of, you know, a hard time. And there's three of us in my office, and one girl says, well, you know what Barbie's going to say. They just don't know they're loved. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm one-dimensional. <laughs> and I think I am because I've had that revelation. I've had that revelation, and as Stan said, we can talk about it all day long. But today we're going to pray that everyone gets that revelation because we need a revelation that, number one, the Father is good and that he loves us. You know, David and I have been married 33 years in November, and we were very broken people. I mean, my dad left my mom and I when I was four, and my very earliest memory is watching him walk out the door. And then David's dad was killed in Vietnam when David was four. So here you have these two broken people trying to figure things out. Don't know the love of a father at all. Just to let you know that the father does redeem everything. Because today my dad and I are very, very close and have been for many, many years. But when we came together, we just were trying to figure out how to do life with another person. And I was highly emotional and highly angry and highly this. And, and then somewhere along the way, I got the revelation that I have a father that loves me. And it changed everything. And so if we find ourselves with those behaviors, it's the behaviors, it's the self-pity, it's the control, it's the judgment. Those are behaviors. And as Stan said, as we get rid of those behaviors, and what I text him, basically he said it is, we can try in our strength all day long to get rid of these behaviors, but without the revelation of the love of God, we will not be victorious. I can say today, okay, I'm not going to be critical, I'm not going to be critical, I'm not going to be critical. And then later today when I'm talking with friends and I walk away from someone, I'm going to go, whoa, be critical. Because I'm doing it in my own strength. But I want to understand that not only does the Father love me, but they love that person so much that maybe had not great things to say. Because they don't know that they're loved and they're not secure in the love of the Father. Then I can go, oh, Lord, show them your love instead of being critical. It changes our lives. It changes everything. Um, getting the revelation of sonship. Getting the revelation that we are not orphans. We are not slaves. We are sons and daughters of the living God. A father that is so good that he gave everything for us. His son came knowing what was going to go before him and yet set with the joy set before him, he endured the cross because you are his joy. He saw you, and he did it for you. And so I want to look at a um, very popular passage, and y'all just listen to me read it in this translation. This is a pan passion translation. 1 Corinthians 13, when we get the revelation of the love of God, it does change our behavior. It really does. And when we see someone with that outward behavior that is acting out and they're judgmental or critical, we just know they haven't gotten that revelation yet, and we get to love them to it instead of pointing our finger and going, why don't you get it together? No, we get to love them. So in this translation, 1 Corinthians 13, it's all about our behavior when we have the revelation of love. Love is large and incredibly patient. Anybody need that one? <laughs> love is gentle 
and consistently kind. Let me get this turn. Consistently kind to all. Consistently kind to all. Anybody struggle with that sometimes? It's just because we need that revelation of the love so we can give it and be consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Our natural bent is negativity. Our natural bent is to be jealous that somebody else is getting blessed. But the love refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love, oh y'all, this is a big one. Love is not easily irritated. Everybody say with me, love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Ow. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stops believing the best for others. Believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. Love never stops loving. So getting that revelation, after we recognize these behaviors that we've had and we want to change so desperately, we've got to get that revelation of his love because it does change everything. Y'all, his love annihilates fear. You heard that scripture, love casts, perfect love casts out fear. Love um, compels us to be kind. Love is generous. You look at what Jesus did. Jesus, he, he, he fed the people. And he gave them all they wanted. And there was a bunch left over because love is generous. Love is serving because what did Jesus do? He washed the disciples' feet. He served people. He served them. Love causes us to, to not retaliate when someone speaks unkindly to us. Jesus was spoken unkindly to all the time. Jesus was bullied but love just says, forgive them because they don't know what they do. They don't know the love of the Father. They don't know a Father's love. Forgive them. That's what love does. Love and grace. I want to just mention a thing about grace because, um, you know, there's that whole grace law, law grace debate. And I just want to talk about grace is the empowerment that we get from the Father through his love. Because if you look at the law, the law says, do not commit murder. That's one of, the, one of the Ten Commandments. But Jesus took it beyond the law because he knew what God's grace will do in us and God's love in us will do. He says, not only should you not commit murder, but bottom line is if you get angry with someone or have hate in your heart, you've already committed murder. Well, you know what? Only his grace can move us beyond the law from not committing murder to not having anger and hatred in our heart. Love, or um, the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, Jesus took it one step further. His grace goes beyond the law because he says, if you even look at someone with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. And grace empowers us to not go there. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is the empowerment to keep from sinning and go beyond. And so when you hear somebody talk about grace and you hear them talk about law, realize it's his grace that empowers us to not only keep the law but go beyond. That's what Jesus did for us because he loves us. So I'm just going to give you a couple, a lot of little things that I was thinking about is love. And then we're going to watch a video. And then we are going to pray because if you haven't received that revelation today, I pray that you get it, but I want to tell you something. It's not a one-time thing. We need to go and sit with him every day. We need to be in his word every day. It's his love letter to us. It's, it's where he speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. We need it, y'all. We need it every day. I cannot go on last Sunday's meal. I have to eat every day, and we need this. We need this every day to fully comprehend 
the love of a father. So his love and his grace, it empowers us to be generous, to be kind, to forgive, to be silent when bullied, not to take offense, to see the good in every person and every situation. Because again, our natural bent is, oh, that was awful, instead of looking for the good. How many of y'all want favor in your life? Because in Proverbs eleven twenty seven it says, if you look for the good, you will obtain favor. So how do we get favor? Look for the good. That's just one of the many ways. Because you're king's kids, you already have favor. You have to know that. But as we look for the good, we're going to see it. And really, we're going to obtain favor as a result of that. His love causes us to be a solution finder instead of a complainer. His love does seek justice. His love moves us with compassion, causes us to serve others and to serve without complaining. His love causes us to go beyond what's required, like we just talked about in the law. His love gives us hope. His love heals broken hearts. His love causes us to be kind to our spouse. Anybody need a dose of love today? <laughs> His love brings deliverance. So I'm, I'm going to just set up this video. This is from a pastor out of Tulsa. His name is Michael Todd at Transformation Church. Um, he did a series called Grace Like a Flood. It's like nine messages. But there's one section I just wanted to watch. This is like an eight and a half minute video. And I wanted to set up the video and just show the video within the video. But Michael Todd does such a good job of setting up this video that I thought I'm just going to let him do it. So um, do you have anything you want to add? No. Okay. Um, so we'll watch this video, and then if the worship team could come up and just play a song, and we'll pray after this video. And if you need a revelation of the love of the Father, if you need to know a Father's love today, maybe you grew up without a father, or maybe your father was angry at you all the time, or maybe you felt like you could never measure up, I want you to get that revelation today of his love. So we'll watch this video, and then we will. Um, so worship team, maybe if you want to come up while the video is going. The grace of God is unearned. And I want to show you a picture of grace. We're done today. I just hope you really realize that the grace of God for you is amazing. Grace is unmerited. The grace of God is undeserved. And the grace of God is unearned. And the grace of God is a person. The grace is Jesus. I want to show you a picture of grace. There's this man named Dick and Rick Hoyt, it's, it's a father and a son. Rick was born with the umbilical cord around his neck, and so he, he had brain damage, and so he's never been able to walk or talk a day in his life. Um, they found out, though, that he was extremely smart. So his mom, Julie, and Dick, they, they taught him how to read the alphabet with just blinking his eyes and moving his eyes. And he would... He, he learned this, and so then they got together with uh, some developers in 1973, and they developed the technology that would allow him to basically move his eyes like a cursor on a mouse and then, like, bump something with his head as, like, a uh, uh, clicker, and he would be able to talk for the first time in 1973. Now, think about that technology. It's in use all over the world today, but they built it for him. And one day they had a tragic accident. He's in high school now. They had a tragic accident with one of the kids at his school, and he, he typed out with his eyes. He, the city was doing a 5K run to raise money for the family of his friend that, that was tragically paralyzed. And he told his dad, I want to run in that race. So his dad began to train. Not a runner, not anybody who's ever done any athletics like this, but he began to train because his only son decided he wanted to run in this race. And so they ran in that 5K. And at the end of the 5K, his dad, Dick, looked at Rick and he said, how do you feel? And he typed out, he said, this is the first time in my life that I haven't felt handicapped. And so his dad continued to train. He literally committed his life to making sure that his son could experience that feeling over and over and over again. And so since then, these two have done over 72 marathons and over 255 triathlons. And if you don't know what a triathlon is, I looked it up because I didn't. A triathlon is 2.4 miles of swimming, 
26.2 miles of running and 112 miles of biking. They've done that over 255 times. So, so when Dick is running, Rick is being pulled behind him or being pushed in front of him. When, when, when Dick is swimming, Rick is in a life raft being pulled by his father. And, and when, when Dick is cycling, Rick is on a seat in front of the bike being carried. I want to show you, I hope you never forget this, a picture of grace.
That is the love of a father. So if you've been struggling and as Stan talked about some of those five different mindsets and you think, man, I do that and I try to control and I find myself judgmental and I find myself critical. Well, let's just pray today that the Father overwhelms us so much with his love that those things go and he fills us. Because our Father pulls us, our Father carries us, our Father pushes us, he is a good father, and that's all that in a good way. He does that. So as the worship team, y'all sing whatever you want to sing. I know you're not pre prepared, but if you want to know the love of a father like that, I want you to come forward. Or if you're struggling with those five mindsets, come forward. Just let him love on you today because it's his love that changes everything. His love that keeps on loving so come forward today and just receive what he has for you. And Father, I just thank you for your amazing love. I thank you that you love us when we do have adverse behaviors. You love us when we're not lovable. You love us. We don't have to do one thing, but just receive it. Just as Rick rode and was carried and was put in the seat as his dad worked and served and pushed and loved him. All Rick did was just receive it. So, Lord, today I ask, Holy Spirit, you give that revelation of your amazing love to your kids today. Let them know that they are sons and they are daughters. They are not orphans. They are not slaves. They have a father who loves them and will go to the greatest distance to pull them out of the muck and the mire. So I thank you today, Father, for your love, for showing us your love, giving revelation all across this room in every way that you know individually for each person. In Jesus' name, we thank you.